So I'm talking today uh, about the uh, sub-project, uh, Collocation Facility Requirements for Open Compute Racks. My name is Mark Dancy. I'm a technical project manager, so I have a vested interest in making sure that um, the facility is ready uh, for the deployment and uh, to mit mitigate against any risks and make sure it goes as smoothly as possible. So on the agenda today, um, it's going to be quite fast paced. Um, a lot of, obviously, in lots of aspects of the data center, and we can look into great detail. Uh, but we're going to be trying brief as possible. Um, if we can keep the questions until the end, that would be really great. Um, so I'm going to go quick background overview of um, how we got to this point. Some uh, key objectives of the, um, of the actual project. Um, can have a look at some of the challenges um, that we feel many kind of facilities are going to face um, when deploying uh, open racks. And then we're going to have a look in detail uh, at various aspects um, of delivery and then the subsystems that we believe should be considered and included in the checklist. Um, and then we can have a look at the checklist in more detail if, uh, if time allows, and then some, uh, some questions at the end, hopefully. Um, I'm sure there will be a little bit of uh, interest uh, you know, to, uh, to go. So, um, just to start things off, this is um, not uncommon a situation where the delivery team um, have not looked at the facility in advance, um, the co-location facility have, have not warned them. Um, and only the other day, uh, I heard about a project where the delivery team were totally unprepared, uncrated it, took it into the facility, and then uh, couldn't get the rack. It was just a few millimeters too big, and they decided to use a crowbar to uh, try and squeeze it in. As you can imagine, the door frame and the rack, yeah, it's not designed to uh, to be squeezed in that way. So, uh, so yes, yeah, something we m must be considered. Delivery pathways. Again, we have situations where the Maybe the co-location facility um, hasn't communicated to the delivery team or to the tenant, uh, or the tenant hasn't looked at the uh, particular facility's um, uh, loading dock. Um, we'll see this is an extreme case. Um, but again, uh, the other day I was involved with a project where the, the delivery team thought that there was going to be a loading dock. So they, came, they turned up with a truck that had no, uh, no tail lift. So what they had to do is they had to bring in another truck with a tail lift that was working. They, used to, they had to back the, tail, the, the trucks together and then move the racks from one truck to another truck onto the truck that had the tail lift that was working so that they could then get it onto the ground and then into the data center. So, Maybe, you know, it's, it, it's obvious to us, um, but it needs to be, you know, uh, we believe it needs to be in that checklist so that no one, you know, forgets about these, these, these things. Um, another challenge, um, has the co-location facility yeah, understood that these racks, when, when populated, can weigh anything between 400 kilograms and 1,500, 1,400 kilograms. And um, yeah, this is the sort of, a, you know, this is the sort of result we're trying to avoid by the creation of, of a checklist and a suitability guide. So just to give you uh, just a quick understanding of how we've um, created the, the checklist, we've split it into, into sections and it's, what we try to do is target it at uh, a particular uh, market because it, uh, we try to, you know, we need to get something out quickly into the marketplace to help the community. We have um, targeted the checklist at the at a European co-location facility that would need to accommodate 
an open rack version two that had a maximum weight of uh, 500 kilograms and a IT load of 6.6 .6 kilowatts. And the, the reason why we've gone for this narrow focus is, is so that we can get something out there quickly. And then other sub projects will henceforth come from this. Um, so just going through various uh, things that we've considered, um, data center access and, and the delivery pathway. So a, a must have requirement that we believe um, the facility needs is to have um, that doorway into the facility um, from the loading dock or from the car park to be at least 2.7 meters high and 1.2 meters wide. 2.7 because the rack being 2.21 meters high, then you've got to add in the crate, you've got the, the pallet truck, that's really going to take it up high. So, so that's where we've, we've pitched it at 2.7. 1.2 because of floor tile being 600 mil wide, said so, okay, to 1.2 600 mil wide, access floor um, tiles, 1.2. So that's the sort of reasoning um, behind um, the consideration. So, so yeah, so we've, we've, within the checklist, we've got must haves, we've got nice to haves, and a nice to have in this um, situation where the rack comes into a facility would be say, say the delivery happened late on in the day and those racks needed to be stored somewhere, then it needs to be considered that a storage area that maybe needs to take 24 crated racks needs to be available. So that's, you know, that, that could be, you know, a nice to have. Um, and a consideration could well be um, only recently we took, um, uh, we took delivery of an open rack and the open rack packaging didn't come with a ramp. Surprisingly enough, crazy. Um, and if the collocation facility was, was aware of this, then they could have a pallet ramp available. Again, it's a consideration, but something to be th thought about um, because the manufacturers aren't always, yeah, they're not always trying to make it easy for us. Another subsystem that we've um, considered is uh, the structural and architectural aspects of the white space. And we've, within the checklist, we've also um, given some guidance around what we think would be an optimum arrangement, not an absolute must have for it to work, but if the, if the facility allowed for it, then a 4.5 meter slab to slab height would, we feel would be an optimum uh, clearance to have, but it would still work at 3.1 meters. So we tried to give some guidance of what it would be great to have, but if you can't, you know, if you can't achieve that, then you know you can get away with 3.1 meters. Um, and we've also looked at um, the space under the access floor um, and given some guidance around, yeah, 900 millimeters if you were using that as a um, cooling pathway. But if not, then yeah, 450 would be would be would be sufficient. Another, obviously, uh, electrical systems. Um, listening this morning about um, you know, the advancements you know, with 48 volts, and uh, I know there's some questions about um, you know, should you have a rack with uh, batteries or, or without. Um, well, we're saying that the minimum would be a three phase uh, 16 amp um, supply. Single, single feed to the rack, um, and it would come from a, um, a central uh, UPS, up, uh, an upstream supply. So you don't have to have um, 
battery backup units um, in in the rack. It would it could work on the um, on the on the central UPS system, and certainly where we're trying to include as many co-location facilities as possible to be uh, to be used for OCP um, adoption. Then we need to be inclusive and allow for that to happen. So we're saying acceptable central UPS upstream supply, but optimum would be would be a a, a non-central uh, UPS use battery backup units in the racks um, because that's a real advantage. That's you know, one of the advantages of um, the OCP um, of the open compute uh, design. Cooling. Um, Again, we've looked at um, the must-haves. We don't want to exclude those that can't provide hot aisle containment, but cold aisle containment and hot aisle containment could be used. Um, we've also included uh, blanking plates within the, um, the uh, must-haves. But if we wanted an optimal situation, then then hot aisle containment um, is clearly the way to go. Um, that's part of the open compute design, uh, front, front access only, um, no need to go to the, to the rear. So we see that the hot aisle containment is optimal, and, but it, will, it can work with, um, with cold aisle containment. So, And uh, last but not least, um, we've looked at the uh, cabling pathways and spaces. Now, this, this is in the area of, of um, a lot of variants um, where it's very much down to the tenant who's going to be deciding on the structure cabling. So we've just given some uh, thoughts within the in a considerations uh, part of the checklist. But certainly one must have needs to be that the cabling has got to be able to get to the front of the rack, either from below or from the top. But a more optimum arrangement would be that the cabling can get to the front, but it's coming from the top. So again, we've given some guidance within, within the checklist for, um, for the pathways. But other than that, we've, we've not said any other must-haves. We've tried to keep it as open as possible because this is an area that, that can change uh, depending on the use case. So I'd be interested to see uh, and show of hands if anyone's actually here, anyone here actually seen the checklist. I know we've published it. We've we got any members of the, of the group. So yeah, just a few. <laughs> Um, so, as you can see, we've, um, just from here, we can have a look at the, the list in more detail, um, but, so we've, this is the top of the, uh, top of the checklist with the attributes on the left-hand side, um, and this, this is the top section here with the must-haves here with the top, and so you can see with the access, we've said it's acceptable to have road level step and threshold free access, but an optimum arrangement would be having a loading dock with a lift or leveler. And then we've given some reasons why, why you know, that's why we've decided that that's an optimum arrangement. So we've, we've tried to put some substance. It's not complete yet. We're still, this is still work in progress, um, but, um, yeah, this, this is a starting point, um, um, that, um, and this is where we are at the moment. So, would anyone like to ask any questions? Uh, a comment that I'll yeah. make is, uh, you know, the, the, for people that are super involved in open compute, and they, you know, you might be scratching your head on some of this stuff, but you, you gotta realize outside of this community, there's a lot of uncertainty. People don't understand what's happening. So the purpose of the checklist is to have a guideline for a good conversation between a tenant 
and the, uh, and the provider uh, to make sure that the open compute deployment goes smoothly. Because the last thing that we want as a community is for this gear to show up and it's a, it's a big nightmare and then people don't want to deploy open compute gear, right? So that's, that's what, what, what they're trying, trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, could we have a show of hands on if we have any tenants here, any prospective tenants for OCP? No? Okay, how about facilities? Anyone that operates a facility? Okay. So it's more of an understanding then for, for people that are outside those groups supporting the, uh, those, those two groups of, uh, of people. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, one thing that, uh, since we have uh, just a little bit of time, that, that kind of came out through discussions in this checklist was when we talked about cabling and pathways, um, you know, Fidelity uh, kind of came up and said, you know, they're, you know when you look at um, uh, the different functions and operational functions of cabling, you know, it'd be nice if there was a standard way so that you can drive the cost down of the cabling and there's a little more standardization. So I don't know if you want to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you've proposed. So at Fidelity, we, we came up with a color schema, and mainly the color schema came up because of the facility itself had a uh, red and blue color scheme for the power. Uh, we walked into facilities 10 years ago and made a lot of sense operationally to sort of stick with that from an operation standpoint. Once that sort of caught on, um, from an electrical standpoint, we said, why don't we do that from a network standpoint? And then we went from a network standpoint to a power standpoint um, in the IT world. So from, for now, going on almost 11 years, we have color-coded every piece of copper and fiber and power cord in the facility. And not only in our RTP facility, which is five megawatts of power there and another five megawatts out in our Omaha facility, and because of that, every one of our instances or cabinets, if you walk up to it and you, you can immediately go to work on a, a cabinet and you, you can disregard a third of the cabling. So if you have an outage on the A side, it's just the red cables. Or if it's the B side, it's just the blue cables. Or if you only have to work on the management cables, you walk up to the black cables. So you immediately just disregard things and the time to market to fix things immensely changes um, and all the cable manufacturers out there um, at the beginning it was like oh we only do black well it's just dye that they put in to make them black it started out white so they just put new dye in and now everybody can make us colors so we've worked and partnered with a bunch of different manufacturers to get us colors almost all of them will do colors for you now um, it's worked out really well and we've added that to the bigger dock here and then there's going to be a separate dock that will eventually get out that sort of de depicts what those colors are and how the cables should be labeled. And all we're really saying on these cables is get away from that EIA colored standard of the jacket being colored, saying aqua and toy coys and orange and whatever those colors are from all those different things, because who knows what multi-mode color they're going to come up with next for OM5 or OM18, whatever, whatever they come up with next, then keep those on the connector heads, but then the jacket color itself come up with a, a, a defined color scheme. And we've come up with that with red, blue, black, and um, some other colors. We can show the schema later, but or you can, we'll, uh, we'll post it. But really what it's about is operationally makes it easier for the guys that are in the data center to get there and figure it out and, and get the stuff fixed faster. Okay. When I think of the, uh, the color scheme and operational efficiency, I kind of think if, if you guys sat in the key, keynotes yesterday and uh, Yahoo Japan kind of did the time study on change and, it, you know, it's, it's very related to that, right? How quickly can you diagnose and, and, mm -hmm. and find things? So maybe producing a very simple color scheme can, you know, help the community out. So it can be good. We've had a lot of other companies that have jumped on board. Uh, we, in the discussions, we found out that there was actually a couple other companies that were already doing the color scheme. So just the more and more people, and if we can get the whole community to sort of make this wave, instead of all of us using yellow or whatever we're buying at mass quantities, we can start 
actually doing a color scheme, then technicians that switch from company to company to company will already understand that, hey, all red cable is the high availability um, high path, and a green cable is a non-redundant path, and then everybody will be on the same page across the board, and things will go by. And there's always been the, uh, the concept that, well, it's really hard to keep a, uh, this going, but over 10 years, it's kind of funny, after like the first year, the, your, your support guys will start calling each other out. Hey, you put the blue cable in the red patch field, and it's obvious. You've got this huge red, sea of red, and then you got one blue cable. Who did that? So it's, it, it takes a while, but after you get it done, it's, it actually turns out to be a pretty neat, neat looking, looking uh, place. Mm. Okay. Does anyone have any input? Sorry, come on. It's on redundancy. The mm. coloring is the... The, the function of the colors is, is redundancy A and B for, uh, for network, for, or uh, what is the function of the color? It's, um, it's not just redundancy, it's all cables. So you can do your redundancy cables, your management cables, your crossover cables. So at, at Fidelity, we uh, red and blue for re redundancy, A and B for redundant pass, B, uh, black for management, pink for crossovers. Uh, funny story, I'll do that offline. Um, <laughs> the um, phone was gray. Um, and I think that's it for the colors. So I'd have to go back and look at the doc, but I think that's the colors. But um, it, really, it's all about just identifying different sub networks, if you will, and what those are. So if it's you know a non-redundant network and it's something that's not critical to the infrastructure, let's identify that, like a management network. Nobody really cares if it goes down, so let's make it black. So if we ripped all those out. We're not losing any data. We can continue on. But if we ripped up all the blues and then we ripped up all the A's, we're going to have a production outage. But we could rip out all the B's or all the reds, and we're still going to be okay on the, B, on the blues. And that's what it's really about. And then greens are usually like non-redundant fast. We usually use greens for uh, sniffers, something that we know that's okay. This is just a sniffer connection, and it's just a, a, a non-redundant uh, path. But it, it is crossing data. Just, it's uh, just a way to Thank call you. it out. Great. So we expect this to be a, a formal submission into the data center project, and, and we'll send it up. And uh, you know, I think it'll be a great, great guideline for the community for those that either don't have a standard or uh, are looking to uh, switch over to something that everybody else is doing. Okay. So does anyone have any sort of input on where? Where this checklist could be used, um, any sub projects that come could come from this. Just wonder if anyone thinks that um, this should be um, focused on particular markets or use cases. Does anyone think that maybe for, for telco that we need a checklist for telco specifically? Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's whether, you know, are our telco companies going to be using co-location facilities? Um, some people say that this is the case. Maybe it isn't. I don't know if anyone's got any... Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're different environments to uh, a standard uh, central office, so, you know, the, the sort of the data zone. Yeah. Because we've, we've pitched it, I mean, you're, I was watching your presentation earlier, it was like 875 kilo <coughs> load, weight load, and we pitched it at 500 being the low level, so at that low level, it wouldn't be suitable for your, for your rack scale architecture, so that, that was interesting. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, yeah, Mark, thank you. Okay.